My name is Joseph Wunderlich. I'm a professor of engineering, architecture, and computer science. This is an advanced course in computer engineering, advanced computer engineering, and parallel processing. That's two different names. Share screen. Now, uh, this is my website. I also have a YouTube channel. You can find all kinds of stuff. Uh, I'm 60 years old, done a bunch of stuff. We're in computer engineering here. You can see all that there. We're going through the syllabi for this course. <clears throat> this is this course right here. So we're at the very end of the course now. Let's organize my windows for a second. Uh, we've gone through everything. I've just updated it again one more time to clarify for the final exam, which is next week. And we are right down here. And this lecture today is focusing on this block here of uh, the research and development I did at IBM. So, um, Let's just start right in there. I'll uh, work off the PDF here instead of the PowerPoint, just because most of these are PDFs. So the very first thing is the evolution of these machines. So they're now called Z series. Uh, they've been enterprise servers in the past called mainframes long ago. Uh, the, these are high performance computing computers up to 512 processors, uh, all kinds of out of order execution, even vector register unit and other things. So these are for all intents and purposes, supercomputers and the supercomputer uh, uh, MPP group was a subset of where I worked uh, up at, at Poughkeepsie and that's what beat Kasparov at chefs and all that. So, uh, yeah. so I'll make this a little smaller here. So this is the Z series <laughs> now they're called. And uh, yeah. So in the early 1940s, um, uh, you know, not IBM was any any ENIAC, University of Pennsylvania for military projectile calculations. You see tubes here on the screen, um, and see here now the difference between tubes and you know tubes and relays, uh, where how everything was made. This is the first uh, disk storage, that huge thing there. That is at IBM. Well, this is also IBM 1950s. The very first thing slide was not IBM. Uh, then in the, in the, in the 1960s, uh, 360 actually meant all points of the compass, but it also was coincidentally in the 1960s. And so this is the, the type of machines I'm talking about here. And then in addition, you'll see my notes here. So this is when I was in I side of IBM. Uh, we developed a custom kernel. I didn't invent it. It would have been around for a while. And this guy here, uh, Jim, Jim Lum, um, we actually brought in for like $300 an hour consulting when we changed everything completely when I was there. Uh, and he had, had retired. But and that, so you see notes and, uh, uh, along here of this custom kernel for testing the supercomputers, uh, both uh, all the testing and quality control. And then therefore design changes came out of my group uh, from USA, IBM, and IBM Germany, the two main groups for developing these machines. Then there was the 370, and that just meant the 1970s version. And a couple things happened in there. We switched from water-cooled bipolar transistor technology to air-cooled, even though there was a performance hit there, and because most of the customers were complaining, the water-cooled systems were so much maintenance. And, uh, and the power to drive them too, as well as the maintenance to keep them running, especially if you're paying a million dollars and it's running your third world country and it's, you know, a big part of your budget just to buy the computer to begin with. Uh, so that happened. Uh, also uh, initial program load, the IPL of the SAC kernel uh, operating system. So I wrote, uh, I wrote a whole bunch of APIs that developed new methodologies uh, to be used that they patented inside and added lots of code uh, in assembly language and in uh, PLX, which is like a mixture of Fortran, Pascal, if you can imagine that. Um, for you, third, first 30, uh, they used 30, first 32 bat addressing from 24 was in the 1970s. And so you just see my notes here um, as I was just getting into IBM things in the 1990s, mid 1990s. So, um, so 370 meaning 1970, even though being updated. Uh, and then first distributed computing also was in IBM then. Well, this is the 1980s. It's oh, still, yes, it was still called the 370 in 1980s. They didn't change it to the, uh, the 380. 
So there's 360s, there's 370s, and then they switch to 390s, and then they just switch to Z servers. And they, you see that in other products too, like you know all the uh, the Pentiums and everything change the names of the called Intel um, doesn't make a lot of sense sometimes, but uh, so you see a number of things. First, rack-mounted computers with separate boards in a rack in a big case, you know, cage. Uh, and then this is a side note here. So until I was 30 years old, I was in the building industry, and I actually got involved in building computer rooms in a couple projects. Two of them in this office park in Texas uh, for developers as the lead project engineer. I came in as the assistant project engineer and project engineer quit in two weeks. So now I'm in charge of this giant project with all these people and lots of money. And then I did the same thing in California, but then I had experience. And so they wrote me up in the paper and made a big deal. I was still just a kid, but everybody was pretty young. The guy with all the money was only 35 years old. And then this is the lead arch principal architect. That's the lead project manager for the general contractor. That's the lead structural engineer. I forget who that is. Uh, yeah, so just I built built three IBM 360s at this this uh, this job and uh, done other things and so then I'm then I go back to school uh, you know I get into high tech or, you know I'm interested in high tech from dealing with all the high tech executives and uh, and engineers and tech people and building buildings for them and so I get into that I had already been somewhat in computing anyway uh, I've had an estimating business and I knew how to program and I uh, did some beta testing on different software when I was an undergrad. I worked with a professor on making that work on the mainframe for graphics. But anyway, so I get into IBM later in life, uh, in my 30s. I mean, I get my master's and PhD, and then I'm, you know, in my mid-30s, and then I get into IBM. Uh, then I was a professor at Purdue after that. So, okay, and then there's lots of details. I'll go into details here. But this is all the stuff that I did at IBM. And this is another lectures too, and I don't want to tax the students here come look at all this, but again. Uh, but so uh, it was uh, a lot of things in there making these new supercomputers work, new 64-bit processing. Uh, and you'll see these other things too, working on branch prediction, out of order execution, uh, virtual address translation and caching. Uh, switching to, to IEEE floating point from hex floating point. So, you know, so something point something times uh, 16 to some power instead of times two to some power, like IEEE binary floating point. Why would they have that? Because IBM invented well, it floating points. Well, it's cached and pretty much a lot of computing things you saw. But at some point, we needed to put the IEEE in there. But we still needed to support the other stuff. So I helped put in 125 new IEEE instructions. That's more development than research. <clears throat> Uh, so now in the 1990s, this is, these are the machines I worked on. We won't zoom in and take a look at all these, but this is just like a Coke machine, vending machine type of thing uh, for about a million dollars. And, uh, and this is just shows you how the different things and performance and cooling and switching from uh, you know, one thing to another and the details of how that breaks down. We won't zoom in on that slide. Uh, this we can see a little more here of how it fits uh, the processors. Uh, the multi-chip module and so um, uh, on a card and each and there are typically 20 of these modules and so there's actually uh, the, the caches at one time were on separate cores and actually was a backup cpu uh, so there's like a core separate core and then a cache and then a controller one but this the whole thing is considered one uh, processor and then it fits into a little module and so you know, it was liquid cooled at first. There were little pistons that came down when it was liquid cooled and there was fluid flowing over it. And then a big, huge system of cooling about three times the size. And that was one reason that it cost so much, it was such a headache to do bipolar, including when I worked on the 360s in Texas and in California. Well, it wasn't 360s in California. That was actually a computer company with our own stuff. But in Texas, there were 360s. And it was, you know, five times the amount of machinery just for the cooling it or the, you know, the floor print of it and the special power for it and everything else. But so, and then when air cooled, you just, you know, blow fans over it. Uh, then the architecture of this. So uh, uh, there's different levels of cache. There's an L1 and an L2, and there's an interleaved uh, cache structure. We'll take a look at that in a second. And the memory cards is actually data and instruction cache. This is a blurry, don't take, don't take a look at this, but this is too blurry, but uh, this is details of going cool, changing to water cool, from water cooled to air cooled, both of those. 
um, more. So switch from water to air. Uh, this was great to reduce the footprint of the machine, but more importantly, eliminate the need for power, powering and maintaining the liquid cooling. Uh, so just lots of details there. Yeah, a little too blurry. This is the translation look aside buffer. We're going to zoom in. I have another thing we're going to click on. We can see this a little better. The translation look aside buffer is for caching virtual address translations. And there's several levels of tables there too, page tables, segment tables. So I had the right code to make this, to test this uh, functionality and try to stress this. The whole idea was of our quality control was try to break the machine so it doesn't break for the customer. So in a three-day window, we would try to put, you know, like 10, 15 years of use type problems or more sometimes by forcing all kinds of uh, hardware stressing of things and weird things like, uh, you know, a cache miss page fault repeatedly over and over, thrashing of different processors trying to use the same piece of memory over and over again, and then a, a page fault simultaneously or some interrupt happening simultaneously, like weird scenarios that could, you know, like unlikely to happen, but we tried to make them happen. Uh, and then uh, again, too tiny, but this is all the details. So let's zoom in some of that. And then parallel Sysplex was another separate group here. I won't talk about that. We talk about optical channels now and how much more bandwidth and how much more communication you can have with them. Uh, and IBM before I got there in the 1990s, everything was optical uh, between, you know, uh, with between machines. The parallel Sysplex can connect several of these big Coke machine type uh, uh, you know, million dollar machines together, but also other networks of other types, Unix, Linux type networks, PC networks, other complete different machines, you know, Hitachi, Fujitsu competitors, I uh, can hook that, you could hook a Silicon Graphics works, I mean, anything you could hook up. And this was an, a crossbar, optical crossbar dynamic interconnect switch, all optical. And then of course we used optical for communication in, in our intranet where we had secure access uh, to other sites in the world. We leased, we had, dedicated optical lines under the ocean and get rented between all the cities. I supervised a, a young engineer in, in Austin, Texas from New York. Uh, I never met him and it was over the, the secure intranet. And some details of that in this parallel sysplex. So this was a separate group on the on one of the boards. We typically had 18 processing cores that are meant just for processors and then separate uh, IO channel, uh, you know, optical channel driving processors with their whole separate instruction set and a separate group. It was in my group, but I knew how it all worked. I had to interface with it at times, and they used my APIs in the custom kernel, but that was a separate group just for the parallel sysplex. Okay, so that's quickly that one. And then the next one is uh, down in here, is processor design, including the cache and out-of-order execution. So this is uh, LIPK. Uh, the father of all design of these machines. And we won't go on the details here, but you know some of the very first out of order sequence. And it's interesting little history here because uh, actually long before this, uh, this chip, you know, before the 1990s, like, you know, uh, 70s, there was out of order execution because it was seen that some some things just took much longer than other things. So memory accesses would take 20 times as long as something else. Uh, some instructions just take much longer. So they were doing out of our execution. But then when the whole caching thing got, came mainstream, which was invented in the 1960s by IBM, it says 25 years ago, this paper is 1990. So um, uh, yeah, this is 1992. So 25 years before that, caching came around and started uh, you know, displacing the need for out of order execution. But then it came back again in the 1990s when everything just you need every bit of bang for the buck you can get, every speed up measure possible. So you max out all the caching scenarios and then you look for more ways to speed up things. So out of order execution. But you know, IBM is doing out of order execution uh, you know, long before anybody else, caching long before anybody else. And you know, this is just a lot of details of the different modules here. I won't go into all that. Uh, we'll take a look at the branch history table. I have a whole report that I wrote on that, on the functionality and the stressing of that on various machines from, from USA and Germany. And uh, translation and aside buffer, again, for students in here and writing your essay, is a cache for virtual addresses translations. The branch history table is a cache for caching and you know, predicting branches. So, you know, you cache data and instructions just when you need them, when you're fetching and your operands and the opcodes. I mean, you, when you're fetching instructions and then you need data for operands, you fetch 
and you go, uh, you know, you need data caches. So, you, but that's this is different. Now we're actually caching translations between virtual and real memory. Remember uh, when you have we and we in IBM, we're one of the first to switch to 64 bit processing. Uh, all of a sudden, the space, the usable space by the systems level and, and application level software balloon to a monstrous size. Two to the 64 is a monstrous size, uh, way beyond any kind of real physical memory. So you translate every time you address any piece of code systems level, uh, does, uh, application level is, is trying to access memory. There's a translation going on and there's several levels of tables in that translation. And so uh, to just get to real memory, the real physical address. And so, so you can imagine there's lots of space within this two to 64 bit address space that has duplicate representations in real memory and only one can be in there at a time. And so you you know you've got you've got page faults and things and you got to get things off the drive storage uh, uh, when that when it happens and try to minimize that and uh, but you know even when everything's on the page that you know everything that you want is you know in real memory you have to do a virtual address translation so knowing that and it's costly you cache those it's different than data instruction you're actually caching the translation same thing with branching anytime you're going to do a branching. Uh, you know, a jump or a, or a program call or a, even an interrupt that goes uh, vectors off to an interrupt service routine. All that stuff was well, a little different with the vector with the interrupts, but but you try to you're predicting. You're trying to predict ahead of time and for speed up purposes, right? <laughs> speed up purposes, you're branching. So that's what students want to know in here and put in a little paragraph in their final that kind of thing. You don't have to drill down on all this, but you hopefully <laughs> skim back through this and take a look at all of it. Uh, and then the architecture here, this is the actual cache architecture, and it's a cache like the students learn in here, but the, it's broken into pieces. And the caches they learn in here, the directory and the, actual, the data and the tags are all kind of one thing here. We had a separate directory and array, but it's essentially the same thing. Um, and then, you know, you, you, you find if your block is in there and you get your data out of the block. If not, there's a miss and you go and get it out of memory. Uh, put it, replace what was in there with something else, grab a giant block for spatial locality reference, because in all probability, you're going to need something close by, either in a program loop or a data array. And so you grab a chunk. And then there's different policies of what you do with that chunk, whether you uh, go and write it through the other caches, and uh, uh, there's different policies there. And so you'll see that down in here, when write back policy and write through policy. I won't get into that here, but it gets gets hairy. And then uh, this is how the caches work. You have dedicated L1s for each CPU and then a shared L2. And that gets tricky to work out too. Um, and to test and stress and redesign. Uh, so the, yeah, more and more here. I want to read all that. You can uh, try to make it quick to read by uh, highlighting things. You can see in here the translation look aside buffer. That's for the caching the virtual address translations. And then here's your, your cache. Uh, with a directory and an array that's actually just the whole cache in itself uh, and the buffers and a bunch of other stuff. Um, yeah, and, and then cache coherency is a very tricky thing. It's uh, this is an undergraduate class, and so even when I had this in grad school, I didn't do cache coherency in any decent way. But I got an IBM, and I was there. I had to actually make things work and follow that. So I bought this book. It was ninety dollars at the time, so that's I don't know, like two hundred dollars a day. Just bought a book on just on cache coherency, and um, it's not a trivial thing to keep about because the problem is. We, in, in, symmetric, we're still talking about in this era uh, and still to this day, SMP machines, symmetric multiprocessing, shared memory processing. So the caches, at any, at any given time, a number of processors could be thinking that they have a piece of data that they're working on uh, from memory and, and they could be the same piece of data, but only one processor can you know, really control it. And more importantly, the caches get them in them, not more importantly, equally importantly. So you have to have like a, a cache controller, an overall controller and a cache coherency policy that invalidates the other caches. And uh, then when you're actually updating, you write back through the different levels. I mean, your own two levels of caching plus the other parallel ones that are on the other processors. So it gets tricky, it gets tricky. Um, uh, this is that one, there's the branch history table there. Uh, for again caching the branches and we'll take a look at that actually a little more in depth in a report in a second um yeah so you could just see what happened you know when you branch or not and uh, all that uh got more stuff 
false hits. These are my notes from almost 30 years ago here. So I remember, I remember most of them, especially pictures. Um, I, I remember pictures, right? <coughs> So, and these are different units here. We have address, calculate, system execution, general execution, floating point. So there's integer and separate, <laughs> separate floating point and general, uh, you know, integer stuff, also system execution. So that you will see in a second, there's a complete separate set of controls for partitioning the machine into multiple machines. For example, right up the road here, where we're in uh, Elizabethtown, Pennsylvania, right near Harrisburg, the capital of Pennsylvania, United States, where all of our military payrolls out of one place for the entire United States, right out of Harrisburg, and they've came came here and talked, and they partitioned one of these three nineties. They came here twenty years ago and showed they partitioned one of these three nineties where they had each branch of the military payroll was on a separate machine within the machine, and so you have all these control rigs and control processing for making that work. Uh, and so I won't get into all the detail of that, but you know it's just the lower levels of complexity and then the out of order sequence so this is again this is mid 1990s and, and and they have been doing it 25 years before that stopped doing it because of cash policy seeming to solve all those problems of you know whatever you need fast to put it in the caches and do that first kind of thing uh, and that was enough speed up but then in the mid 1990s went back to this <coughs> and, uh, and re-pioneered that in my group um, and that's it, that. Okay, so you know, read that, students. And the next thing uh, is down in here. Uh, this is uh, principle pops principles of operation. So uh, I can jump up now and show the students. But in that second shelf down there that they can see, there's this huge thing. Looks like a I'll say a telephone book. We don't know what telephone books look like. Big monstrous white bound with blue letters and it says pops on it. Uh, I don't know, 2000 pages or something. And this is just a summary of that. So you can tell by now, this is how I like to summarize things. We're gonna come back and look at virtual address translation in a second and the different levels in here. But this is just all the functionality and this is just storage and uh, ways to deal with things and the address formations, which are tricky. And uh, the control, like I mentioned, breaking the machine into different pieces virtual, uh, what we'll won't call it virtual machines, but different machines, <clears throat> program status word, which just like the students learn. And here is more uh, when they do the microcontrollers, it's not just status, it's actually a control reg too. So there's bits in there to reconfigure the machine, just like the regist default register set in the 8051 microcontroller that they learn in the semi-language. And uh, well, actually, of course, before this, but... Um, <clears throat> And then other things, multiprocessing, da, 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 program execution, lots of details, address register translations. And then uh, here's now there's 1500 ish instructions at the time. Uh, a typical Pentium at that time was around 500. Same with the Motorola, 500 machine instructions. Katami extensions come out with patent for Pentiums. And I guess what, the uh, late 1990s, they went up to about six, 700. They still nowhere near this. This is, well, it's probably up near 2000 now, but in the mid 1990s, we were approaching 1500 instructions. So I'm certainly not gonna show all of them. And then all these different instruction formats. So every format too, and this was a CISC machine. It wasn't a RISC machine. So in RISC machines, you have reduced instruction. The 1400 is certainly not reduced. But more importantly, in this particular example here, I'm showing you that uh, in RISC machines, you have fixed boundaries. Every instruction comes in. You know where the opcodes are. You know where the operand fields are. You can start parsing that right away. Our, this machine was way too complex for that. So there's different formats depending on the instruction and how it breaks out. And you start executing a million different things. So, and then this was something that got implemented as PC fast was a way to get through some of the page table lookup things and uh, had to implement something for that as a special case and override and then interrupts. That was a whole other headache in itself. So get to that. Okay. So that's principles of operation of these creatures that I worked on. Then we did, um, there was a quick reference here. I'll just show that quickly. Quick reference thing. Uh, this is, uh, you know, what we all just kind of carry around like a little booklet. And this is all the different uh, instruction formats and different types of instructions is all different types of instructions we had to memorize. Uh, didn't memorize the actual machine code. There's one guy who was there 30 years and he was pr prided himself on being a dump reader. And that meant when we would test the machines and break them, all of a sudden we'd have to do a memory dump and see where the machine was when it broke. 
because we broke it on purpose. And so you'd have to go and trace all the, all the instructions and data. He had memorized every op code. He could he actually read a machine language. Now, you know, that's nice. I pride myself on trying to do that, but um, memorize 1400 op codes. But I knew how every one of them worked. So this, these are all um, you know, branchings, different instructions, different formats. Well, this is our quick reference sheet. Um, you know, you're saying that's not quick. Epsodic, what's that? You all know ASCII for characters. Well, IBM re invented the way to represent characters rather than numbers in bits, and it was called Epsodic. And then ASCII came along, and they said, "Okay, well, we'll implement that too." So there were lots of lots of code in places where I had to do things both Epsodic and ASCII to maintain compatibility with machines going back. Some binary stuff here, basic computing things. There's a lookup. Okay, that's our quick reference manual. So again, we did just did a, a, his, a history of these machines. We did look at the processor. We looked at the principles of operation, the Bible of functionality of these creatures, uh, and then the quick reference, and then some specific things I did. So branch prediction. So this is a report. Now, uh, I, I make a disclaimer here that I've never showed, never put this on the internet until now. This is almost 30 years later. This was IBM Confidential at the time. I'm assuming it's, there's some statute of limitations uh, you know, on this. So, uh, so this is branch shift. I'm, 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 I'm doing all this stuff to see how the branch history table works and then modify the code accordingly, and also concurrently looking at the translation mm -hmm. look aside bug for an out or execution. Again, this is mid-1990s. Uh, and then this is the code, uh, how it executes and how I had to modify it and stuff like that, just details. Still use flowcharts. My scribble from back then, and then uh, the different uh, uh, machines supporting documents. These are all the machines I mentioned. So these are the ones that I, I kept track of. So I did this, I wrote this report in 96. And so there was some in development. We had code names. Now, I'm not breaching any confidentiality now because, but you just know that we, for security reasons, would rotate the names, have separate code names for everything that would change three, every three to six months because there were spies around. We had a highly secure facility. Uh, nobody had exterior windows. Um, we had a helicopter flying around all the time. We'd have, you have to badge into the complex, badge into your building, badge into the special area where we were doing the R&D, and then special access to the test floor that only me and a few people had to actually get to the machines and uh, the prototype machines. <coughs> and this is a history of, you see them switching from air, you know, air to water, um, from water to air, from bipolar to air, as I mentioned, the code names, and then where they're made. So the GDR is the German Democratic Republic in Bubligen, Germany. And so we interfaced with them quite a bit. Poughkeepsie, where, where I was, uh, Kingston was mostly uh, originally a fabrication facility. And then, um, so it's mostly you know, Poughkeepsie and, and Bublik in Germany in my era. <clears throat> and then details, I'll go in here, but each of the branch history tables and how that all works, uh, you know, it's similar to caching kind of things, a cache design the students learn it here. And these are all on different machines. You know, that was Alliance 98. This one was some other one up here. This is the H5, H6. So I'm analyzing how they're all different. And, uh, test cases, special scenarios for aggravating the aggravation stream. And then the, the, the degree of randomness is stuff that I in, invented and got a patent that, that we'll see in a second. So all these machines, uh, that this, is, uh, this is just analyzing uh, the entry state table and phobia coverage, you know, present state and next state. So how you're sequencing through this functionality of this thing. Our students in here know how to do sequential circuit design. They know what that means. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, is it ready or not? So I'm analyzing this writing report, blah, blah, blah. Uh, are we ready for the next machine? What do we need to do differently? Here's all my recommendations of things to do differently or, you know, or do again. Uh, future testing methodologies and make something up there and, you know, so I'm, I'm first giving recommendations for the next generation coming out. And we switched to every six months releasing machine. Before I got there several years before, it was once every two years. But then it was really heating up uh, computing and the economy was great in the mid-1990s. 
were booming and we switched from a two year release to every six months, a new machine. And we're competing with the Fujitsu, Fujitsu, Fujitsu and Hitachi and uh, Amdao who are our main competitors for this kind of machine. And they're putting them out and we're putting them out. And uh, very successful seas. And then so future stuff. So, um, so the primary objective da, 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 should be to comprehensively test the functionality of the BHT. So reports about the branch history table, uh, while also biasing testing towards creating unlikely but possibly critical scenarios. This should include a number of things. Uh, a BHT hit, a successful target prefetch, BHT hit but branch not taken, recover, modify entry, you know, hit wrong target address, hit not a branch or a different branch, you know, uh, branch miss, then replacement, at least recently used replacement policy, just like cash replacement policies. There are various ones you can use, but a stress replacement algorithm, forcing repeated BHT misses, stress all partitioning and BHT uh, by stressing all congruence classes, and I'll describe all that now, create loops, uh, test every branch, minimize limitations, create solvers to simulate computations, which determine whether or not a branch is taken. So we would run using numerical methods, uh, things, I, 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 we, we had simulations of execution that we would run and then test the hardware simultaneous to our simulations and compare. And we did that numerically too. So I'm showing, I'm showing here a book of numerical analysis. So we went to 32 to 64 bit process and we had to have precision in 64 bits, you know, uh, in, in for like a square root thing. And so that, that was a, like a week just getting a simulation to test the hardware. On, our, on oddly enough, a simulation of the 64-bit architecture on a 32-bit machine that we were simulating instruction execution uh, on top of the architectural simulation. All right. So yeah, so there's a lot of complexity. Um, and then lastly here, well, not lastly, this is, this is back in the virtual address translation, just a quick, we already kind of looked at this, but I zoom in a little bit more here. And this is just, this just to give you an idea of the complexity here. Um, let's see, can I get to that? Yeah, that right here. So you can see dynamic address translation, virtual addresses, uh, segment tables, uh, where the page tables. Oh, here's the here's the translation. Look aside buffer with page table entries. Way, way too many acronyms as is with any huge corporation. So. Uh, it's a whole story I can tell you just about abuse of acronyms inside of IBM. Pretty much any three letters that you could come up with would have more than a couple hits. I mean, any three letters, that's when acronyms get out of hand. And there's actually a little macro on one of the, that somebody wrote just to prove it, to show you that, but uh, it's at IBM. But yeah, so, you know, virtual address translations, it's not just one virtual address and then immediately a real address comes out. You know, you got to go through these tables, uh, and you know, page tables, segment tables, you got to look in the cache and then there's your real address. And so, and, and it's, it's grouped. It's, I mean, there's efficiencies, reasons that you use these tables. So you're not just like exhaustively doing uh, you know, the same thing every time when you can kind of apply one methodology to a group of virtual address translations on a page. So then lastly is, uh, so there's, there's a bunch of development stuff and then uh, things that are more in line with pure research kind of things would be this here, which is, this is a, a quality control verification, controlled <laughs> randomness that they patented. So this is um, that, and I won't go into all the details of this, but this is the actual user manuals. This is the actual user manual that I made which was, you know, we were completely paperless in the mid 1990s. So everything is electronic. And this is in, you know, essentially kind of a readme file or in the prologue to the kernel, you know, kind of thing for the application or the systems level programmers to use these APIs that I'm creating. Now, these, these were uh, different functions for generating. You don't know what all this means, but so uh, the, there's, these are all this terminology for random number generators, linear congruent combined linear Fibonacci, these are different things. Uh, I would probably want to explain fully here, but you, you, I mean, to fully understand random number generators and combining them, you got to understand this and all the quality. And I do want the students to kind of read through this. And I believe I asked them to some, make some sense 
in just a paragraph of this. Um, and so, you know, what is a, a linear congruent generator design? You're putting two of them together. Or no, no, linear just has a, 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 has a period equal, a period is how often it repeats. So this is not purely random. These are sequences of numbers that repeat themselves. All random number generators will do that. Um, the only way to get completely unrepeatable is to do some kind of like a, shoot a laser through a lava lamp or some weird, the people have actually done that kind of thing. And yeah, it's something that's just truly random. But this is, this is not, these are algorithms. So there's degrees of randomness. And then there's forward and backward stepping. So we need to, and this is modulo arithmetic and don't worry about all that, but this is actually, we have to code this. And my macros, I mean, my APIs had to do this. But so we have to be able to go backwards because when we break the machine, we got to go back and step through the program and, see, and get to where the break point was. So we know what actually we did that we're trying to you know, catch. Uh, and so I won't get into all that, but this, so this, I don't normally show this because this is for programmers inside IBM. <laughs> And I'll show you the paper I wrote after that. But this is, uh, this is uh, I have just some code for that. I won't go into the details of that. But combined linear generator is another type of, if you put two of them together and you get better, a little better, but then of course you have overhead in doing that. A Fibonacci generator, you have to seed and actually an array with another generator and then pick the initial uh, seed out of that to start the, the main generator. So good generator properties. And so I do ask students, this, this has been used for at least several years in industry, produces a string of numbers, which I do ask students about this too, which is IID, which approximates an independent and identically distributed source. That's what IID is. I, independent means the probability of a number being regenerated is independent of when others are generated. Uh, no conditional dependence. Identically distributed means all numbers have an equal probability of being generated and a uniform distribution. Uh, for independence, rely on documented testing in published literature for identical distributed. Additional testing was done, I did, to examine the bit uniformity of each generated 32-bit word for each generated, uh, each generated, uh, only the best fits, you know, yeah. And then long periods of how long it takes to repeat is the third one. Uh, I won't read all this thing. Uh, uh, non-overlapping segments. Uh, so not only a continuous stream, but that there's not too much correlation between overlapping, you know, between segments, string pieces, uh, and then the speed of the generator, you know, how many runs can we get, you know, uh, billions of tests within a three-day window. Hopefully we're releasing these things every, every uh, six months and the, the actually the kernel got updated every month. So the end of the month, we would update the, the, the kernel and the APIs. So you had to have working stuff from conception typically in you know a couple months. So uh, you may want no repeats of a number with a speed with a seed generator is a period since repeating base seeds mean an identical pass. So what happens here is there's a seed generator that to the, that, uh, there's a picture coming down. You probably need to see the picture first. I'll show you the picture. So don't memorize all this. There's a, um, a seeding generator which creates random numbers and that generates the pass a seed for the past generators. And so this each program execution, you have multiple threads going at a time, trying to break different pieces of hardware. And so we're putting like random data in arrays, random decision, you know, changing the, the criteria and loop counts and, and branching criteria. Uh, it, that's at the program level. And those threads are running separately and in parallel, but each of them seeded by a seeding generator. So when something breaks, like you can back up down, you know, you got to go back down the C generator and find the thread and then go down the thread, back up that, see what went wrong. So there's seeding and seeding and past generators. Uh, students don't have to know all that. I just want to be able to write a little essay and they, they've got a copy, you know, a partial take home with them. So uh, they know what to look for. So uh, oh, and here's, wait, sorry, back in here, some other things, speed, to cycle, minimum seed memory requirements, like that seeding array I told you with Fibonacci. Uh, minimal restriction on the seeds, reversibility, that was key. I had to actually derive uh, reverse uh, multipliers on a couple of them. And they were really happy that I did that because they thought, oh no, crap, you found something good, but you can't make it go backwards. And that's something unique for the way we were using random number generators. Most people don't want to go backwards, trace what they're doing. Um, uh, repeatability required for bugging, da, 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 all this. Uh, this is how you invoke the different uh, macros, the code. <clears throat> Uh, and then the different generators, min standard RANDU, the, the, this, this is old gen seed RANDU, 
these are different generators. Um, SAC used the crappy generator for a while, and then I found out that, and I fixed it for them, and I put in seven different ones that you can correlate in different reasons for different ways, for different combinations, uh, ways to use all that. Um, you know, students just write a little essay, you know, one paragraph, and, and it, it includes just a mention of some of this stuff and the Fibonacci and then the quality. So I assess them for speed up time, runs time, long runs, you know, repeated numbers. Yes. Number of seeds with blah, blah, blah. Uh, uh, two seeds need to be updated in the seed table each time. This is for the Fibonacci. So that's tricky. Uh, there's two Fibonacci's, the lag Fibonacci, the other Fibonacci. And then uh, equal headache, even actually more, but really, really good randomness. And then pairs uh, random numbers and then this is a summary table of all the different kinds of random number generators and the overall quality the iid characteristics as well as uh, overlapping streams and speed up and for long and short runs period period you know all, all this criteria i just mentioned and i assess the quality so they can pick which ones they want to use and then this controlled randomness is a way to combine these things so for example uh, you know, once all that was developed for filling large data arrays or for programs with few past generator, past gen invocations, you choose CGen equals min standard uh, or, or this, and oh, CGen equals this generator and the past gen equals this. For very fast reversible passes, a single seed and okay randomness, but small period and overlapping segments. So I'm giving the programmers the ability to choose, choose what they're doing in both the past generator and the seed generator for certain degrees of controlled randomness. Uh, for programs with past gens, uh, some reversible, choose da, 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 da. for very random reversible past gens in a big period, but overlapping segments in two seats to handle. Uh, for programs with many past gens, non reversible, now you do these two the Fibonacci or time consuming for the ultimate in non correlated passes, very good word independence and in non overlapping segments, but not reversible because you've got the seed array. So that was that's 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 one big problem with that thing, but you can super you know, random for any problem, and there's just no way to reverse it because you have the seed array. Uh, for any problem where intentional <laughs> lack of randomness and high correlation between passes. So intentionally bad randomness and correlation on purpose so that you have, uh, you know, some uh, in relation between successive or, or, or sequential or parallel threads running. This may closely simulate actual code execution. Lack of randomness and independence between passes may sometimes be a good thing. Exclamation point. So you know, don't rule out the crappy one because you may want some you know, correlation. Um, and then this was uh, uh, yeah, just pictures of all that. So this is you know, how the code runs, and da, da, da. the past generators I mentioned, the seed generator and the past generators, uh, ideal generators. You know, this is, is a presentation. So I showed you the actual program, what the programmers look at. And then this was a presentation to everybody in the R&D group and IBM. Uh, see all that. So this all makes sense inside of IBM. I didn't have to explain all of it. Uh, empirical, theoretical, uh, test of how well generator approximates ID source. So, you, you know, if you look at all that, but um, uh, these images got corrupted. So these, uh, this actually showed you the nice diagrams of uh, what the, how to look at uh, quality of a random number generator. I believe I have one someplace you can still look at. Good and bad ones. There's ways of you know, looking at these, let me see. Uh, good and bad parallel strategy somewhere in here. Seed generator, past generator. Uh, this is this that table again. So that, this sample code, the API code that I wrote. Some of that. Um, it's a little more clear. So I was out of IBM for about ten years. I wrote a paper, not specifically revealing any details of what IBM does, but I, in general, for all computers. And it looked like this. And uh, this is the last thing here. So this is an IEEE paper. And then you see similar things in here. And this is what I mean when I, you see in the, I asked the students in the essay, what is a three tuple? So if you take any three successive numbers generated by a random number generator and you plot them on an X, Y, Z axis, you can then see if you get some kind of patterns in the three tuples. Now you want to do this in n-dimensional space and you can't really visualize that. And there's ways of seeing if you get patterns in n-dimensional space. But in three-dimensional space, where you take three successive uh, 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 you know, points generated and then plot them one at a time as a point, and you start seeing things like this, this tells you this is not good 
good good randomness. There's some, I mean, this there shouldn't be patterns showing up. And so um, those other images that didn't survive the upgrade and compatibility of the software here. And uh, you know, but but so now here, and here's all just talking about the same kind of stuff. I mean, it's similar, but not revealing any trade secrets and what I presented and all that. In Jamaica, that was nice. I was the session chair, but I had to end up being the session chair for a whole bunch of other sessions because everybody would give their talk and then they'd go disappear with their family or whoever and go on the beach. And like nobody was showing up for their talks. And uh, so we had to organize. I work, I grouped together a bunch of sessions and, and semi helped take over the conference. And there's just more slides, same thing. It's all the same thing. I'm not sure why I have a duplicate there, but okay. All right. So that again, now um, for students in here, uh, we need to move on to some other things. Uh, we'll finish up here, right there. And then uh, you know, next time we'll do this critical time, we've done everything else. Okay, so hopefully we got a recording of that. And that wasn't too long, we're 438. Good says so pretty short. So I'll stop sharing. Um, any comments on that? Quality control is not something people do a lot of. Um, IBM prided itself on that. And that's one of the reasons, I can tell one quick story. I got inside of IBM, there was 450,000 people at the time. Uh, Richard Atardi was the, uh, the general manager for the microelectronics division, including what I was in my group, which was the System 390 uh, hardware development lab, including our R&D people. And Power Parallel was also part of us, but there's only 22 people in that and they made the, the uh, uh, deep blue, you know, the SP2 that beat Kasparov's the chefs. But anyway, so I get an interview for two hours with this guy. And so I, I ask him, you know, kind of, I was kind of a wise guy. He was a wise guy too. And I, I say, how could you lose all of the uh, revenue for, you know, you lose, it's the mid 1990s. I, I was around and using IBM PCs when IBM dominated all PCs. I don't see any IBM PCs anymore. I mean, you don't seem to care. And then, so he, he tells me, well, he said like, he didn't say look buddy, but he said pretty much, um, it was never more than 10% of our revenue. And the reason I'm telling you this is because he said, you know, people pay a million dollars for these machines because of the quality control that you are part of, he's telling me, or will be part of. Uh, and he gave me a, a, an example where he was at a big trade fair and it was all CEOs, you know, multi-million dollar salary people around him. And, and he's, you know, the general manager. I'm sure he made a couple million dollars too. And he's a, uh, uh, he, and people are in one CEO says, why should we pay a million dollars for this machine? And he says, well, watch this. And he goes and he uh, uh, he just starts like randomly clicking on all the boards and that's uh, everything blips and then comes right back up. And then he goes and he actually he asked one of the techs to physically pull a board out of the rack that was executing and it completely shunted everything to another board. And then he actually went and turned off the entire power for the thing and turned it back up. And it all came back up like within seconds. So he said, this is what you pay a million dollars for. This runs air traffic control. This runs the banking systems, including New York Stock Exchange. And this runs a lot of military systems. It, this is not something that you can tolerate fault, any kind of faults with. And when we were inside there, we used to mock uh, you know, uh, uh, Bill Gates and, uh, and, and Microsoft because they, at that time, Windows 95 was released with 5,000 known bugs. And their policy was release it with bugs because people just upgrade. But if you're paying, you're doing mission critical stuff, and you're talking about collapsing of governments and banking systems and you know, aircraft, uh, the entire air traffic control system, there's no messing around. So, you know, quality control. And so the students in here, they know that I harp on that and I want to see their paradigms, testing paradigms in their reports and everything. I, I probably should have asked a separate question just on testing, but it'd be nice. Well, you, you should in this essay when you answer this say something about quality control and the importance of it. All right. Nice little story to end. A bedtime story, if I didn't put you to sleep already. All right, let's stop recording. Oh, I hope I got that.